Good morning. Welcome back to Station Church Online. I'm Pastor Brittany, and I am so glad that you have chosen to join us this Sunday here at Station Church. If you didn't know, uh, you can join us in person every Sunday morning at 1030 AM. We are following social distancing protocols. We are wearing masks. So if you would like to find out more about joining us in person, you can visit our website, www.station.church. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can feel free to send us a message right here on Facebook. If you are new with us this morning, we would love an opportunity to connect with you. If you could please go to our website and fill out our digital connect card, uh, you'll get a note from us in the mail. And we just want to say, hey, and thanks for joining us online. You'll find that connection card at www.station.church forward slash I'm new. As always, if you're a member of the Station family and you are giving this morning, you can give online at station.church forward slash give. Let's worship together this morning. Well, I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. And I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and he caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. that he has built for me in glory and I heard about those streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day the song of victory.
plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. the burden of sin this power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win this wonderful power in the blood yes there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the land well there is power From your passion and pride, this power in the blood, oh, power in the blood, come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. This wonderful power in the blood, oh, yes, there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. much wider than snow this power in the blood oh power in the blood sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow there's wonderful power in the blood yes there is power power wonder working power in the blood service for Jesus your King. This power in the blood, oh power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing. There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. in shame could not get past my blame until he called my name i'm so glad he changed me darkness held me down but jesus pulled me out and i'm no longer bound i'm so glad he changed me see i a new creation in christ the old has gone there's new life i live Jesus opened eyes. 
eyes now i see the light i'm so glad he changed me now i'm walking free i've got the victory see it's all over me i'm so glad he changed me see i now a new creation in christ the old is gone as you i live by faith i live by faith not by sight there is a new name risen down in glory and it's mine yes it's mine i've read the author of my story tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. If you are just joining us this morning, welcome. I'm Pastor Brittany, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us here at Station Church this morning. The world changes so fast. Think about it. Remember when you used to eat birthday cake right after someone blew on it? You didn't obsess about washing your hands. You shook hands with strangers. You worshiped together in church, and you hugged all of your friends when you walked in the door. You asked a friend over for dinner without worrying about putting them in an awkward position. You let your children play on public playgrounds. You believed in the five second rule and you even taught it to your children. You didn't cringe when somebody sneezed or coughed. You pumped gas without fear of contracting a life-threatening illness. Uh, when you went shopping, you used handrails and carts that thousands of hands had touched. You didn't worry about if your face, uh, if your face mask matched your dress. You went to buffets. Uh, you used to spit to seal an envelope so that someone you care enough to send a card to had to touch the part that was covered in three-day-old saliva in order to read your endearing note. Now, it's not the first time that we've experienced sudden change. On September 11th, 2001, terrorists flew planes into buildings. And before that, you could eat lunch in an airport. You could fly without a driver's license. You could walk your family member to the gate to say goodbye. You could travel with a gallon of shampoo and carry on your contact solution, and no one cared. You could go to Disney World without having uh, your purse or your backpack searched. And now more than 1,200 government organizations and 1,900 private companies do work related to counterterrorism, homeland security, and intelligence. Things change. In fact, many things are planned to change. Maybe you've heard of the term planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence means that when a product is developed, its lifespan is predetermined. See, household appliances used to last 25 years, and now they last four to 10 years, if you're lucky. Computers are built with the knowledge that they'll soon be obsolete. 
You buy an iPhone knowing that in one year there will be a new, improved, and better model. And some of you even remember when your phone cord was actually connected to the wall. And it's not just stuff. Uh, People are making major life changes more than ever before. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average worker holds 10 different jobs before the age of 40. And that number is projected to grow. In fact, Forrester Research predicts that today's youngest workers will hold 12 to 15 jobs in their lifetime. The average American is expected to move 11.4 times in their lifetime and own 9.4 cars. See, I'm 30, I'm gonna be 31 in a month and I've already owned seven cars. You're projected to own 43.9 phones, 17.2 desktop computers and 13.2 coffee makers. That's quite a lot of change. The world, society, and culture are constantly changing. In fact, the only thing that seems constant right now is change. And I understand that some of you might be saying, well, I love change. But if your family eats at the table or sits at the couch to watch TV, you have your seat, the place where you always sit. And many of you even have that in church or at least you did until everything changed for social distancing. But even now, you've found a new spot to claim as yours. People who love change, love change when they love the change. But if you change something that they love, they don't love the change. In an ever-shifting, always changing, uncertain world, what you need is an anchor, something solid, something certain unchanging, dependable, and true. The verse that we look at today promises exactly that, an anchor for your soul. The book of Hebrews is unique among the New Testament letters in that it's not named for the church that it was written to, nor the author. See, throughout church history, Paul has been assumed as the author and And I think that that's probably correct, but there's also a possibility that a woman named Priscilla, who was a leader in the early church, wrote it. The book was written to former Jews who were now Christians and suffering persecution. They were being pressured to abandon Christianity, to renounce Jesus as Messiah, and to return to the Jewish faith. The author of Hebrews challenged the believers not to give up, but to endure. Hebrews 2, verse 1. We must pay careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. And if we jump to chapter 3, verse 12, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Remember, this warning was written to believers who knew the truth and had made the decision to follow Jesus. Those two passages make it clear that Christians can walk away from their relationship with God. You can choose to turn away or easily drift away from him. I want to pause right here. I don't fear many things, but if there's one thing that I'm keenly aware of, it's how quickly and easily uh, we can drift away from relationship with God. My biggest sin by far is the sin of omission. And when I get distracted, it's easy to put my focus on my situation rather than on the God who knows about my situation. I fear the ease of that drift. And this awareness keeps me grounded and constantly course correcting when I take my attention off of my relationship with the Lord. Let's look at verse 14 again. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence that we had at first. I want to ask, how about you this morning? Have you allowed your heart to become hard? Have you drifted away from relationship with God? Are you holding firmly onto Jesus? Was there a time when 
You were more in love with Jesus than you are right now. And if, as I'm asking this question, you're saying, you know what, Pastor Brittany, I'm really not in a great place. I really have drifted from Jesus. You know what? I really was in love with Jesus more before than I am right now. I want to pray for you. God, I thank you that you are a loving and consistent God. Lord, when we drift away from you, God, you never leave us. You never forsake us. You are right by our side. And God, you are standing there waiting for us to turn our eyes back to you. So Father, this morning, as we walk through the rest of this message, God, I pray that you would still us in this moment. God, that in this moment, we would turn our hearts towards you. And Father, we would be encouraged knowing, God, that it takes that one prayer to refocus our eyes on the God who knows all about our situation. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The purpose of the letter to the Hebrews was to remind them why they believed, to give them instructions on what to do in light of their belief, and to encourage them to live in a way that honored Christ. Chapter uh, 13 of Hebrews gives a series of commands to the believers. They're reminders of how a Christian should act. Hebrews 13 verse 1. Keep on loving each other as brothers. And in John chapter 13, Jesus said, A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Our love for each other is a sign to the world that we are followers of Jesus. And when you lack love for other Christians, the exact opposite is true. You're destroying your testimony and you're building a roadblock for others on their journey in believing in Christ. Being brothers means our Christian connection, our connection in Jesus. It's greater than any other connection. Brothers in Christ supersedes race. It supersedes ethnic origin. Brothers in Christ supersedes the country that we're from. Brothers in Christ supersedes heritage. In Christ, we are family. And so I want you to remember this. When you're tempted to criticize or have a negative thought about another believer, I want to remind you that we have an enemy, Satan. We are not each other's enemy. We may not agree on everything and someone else's opinion may not be your preference. You might not like all of the changes that are happening right now, but we must keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. And so I want you to make it a priority to assume the best about your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's go back to verse two. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you are their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. The church, the early church, was exceptional at living out this command. When Proteus, a leader in the church, was arrested and imprisoned, Christians did everything in their power to have him released. And when that proved impossible, church leaders honored the command, remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners. See, they brought him meals. They sat in prison with Proteus. They read scripture out loud. They even bribed the guards to allow them to stay overnight in the cell with him. They shared the actual living conditions of an imprisoned brother in order to demonstrate their solidarity with him. That is love. For a brother. A grandfather visited his grandson and he kept on getting in trouble with mom because every time the baby cried, granddad went into the room and took him out of the crib. And finally, mom had enough. She insisted, dad, leave him in the crib. And a while later, mom noticed uh, how quiet the house had become and the baby was quiet and granddad was nowhere to be found. She went into the baby's room And to her surprise, she found her father cramped into the crib, holding her sleeping son. 
Dad, what are you doing? She asked. And the father smiled and said, hey, you told me not to take him out. You never said anything about getting in with him. Real love sometimes means crawling into the situation your brothers or your sister is in and walking through it with them. It's more than just saying, I'm praying for you. It's saying, I am in this with you. And that's why we have to listen and learn what others are facing and feeling. Our love for God and our love for each other should always lead towards love for others. Every soul matters to God. And how you react to the hurting is a sign of your love for God. Now here's the balance point though. From time to time, someone attempts to gain my approval or asks me for something. And then they demand that I must do what they're asking because they might be an angel. And I just want to tell you this morning that that's not how scripture works. It is not designed as a weapon to get what you want. Scripture is a command to love. Let's go to verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Love each other. Love others. Now, show your love for your spouse by avoiding sexual immorality. And I want you to notice the, the shift in tone. God judges sexual sin. You can't separate that part uh, of your life from your relationship with God. Verse five, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That promise is often quoted out of context. And right here, this promise is given in regards to your money. The reason why you can trust God with your finances and obey his commands is because he has promised to always be with you. A lack of giving and a selfish spirit reveal a heart that is not confident in God's provision or promise. Let's go to verse five. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say this with confidence. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Isn't that an amazing passage of scripture? As you trust God, you have a promise. He will be with you. And because of that promise, you can live without fear. When God is on your side, you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear the economy. You don't have to fear the stock market. You don't have to fear the government or broken systems. The writer continues in verse seven, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Follow the right kind of leaders and imitate their faith. Do what they do, become what they are. I can always tell you when someone has found a new wrong kind of leader, they're so easy to spot because their decisions change. They often shun their friends or they walk away from biblical community. They are imitating someone else. And right here in this context comes the next verse, the promise that we look at today. In a chaotic, unnerving, ever-changing world, this promise has bought, this promise has brought encouragement, confidence, peace, and hope to generations of believers. Let's go to verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is why you don't give up. This is why you keep trusting. This is why you keep going. This is why you treat all people right. And this is why you choose to believe the best about people. This is why you don't have to live in fear because Jesus is unchanging. He is a, a solid soul anchor that you can count on. He has always been and he will always be. He doesn't need updating. He doesn't need upgrading. He's not obsolete and there's not a new or better model. Jesus doesn't change. The gospel doesn't change. It's comforting to know that the message of Jesus, that his love and his grace 
doesn't change. Friends, you can trust him. You can have confidence in him. And he has always been and he will always be. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can count on him. And when you wake up tomorrow, he will still be there unchanged. He doesn't throw in the towel when things get tough because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's slow down and look at that promise. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. What does yesterday mean? Don't forget about the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. He suffered and he died to pay the price for your sin and to put you in right relationship with God. Verse eight, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today. There are pressures all around and it is right now easier to turn away than ever before. Society, culture, secularism, schools, friends, and family, they all compete for your attention and all can pull your attention away from Jesus or even push you to abandon trust in him. And it seems like every day there are massive changes that could pull your attention away from the one who never changes. Everett Fjordback wrote, we must remember this. Whatever happens to us may be used by God and in conforming us to the image of his son. We are in the process of being changed, but it is we who are being changed. Jesus never changes. As we think of these changes, changes in the world, changes in moral standards, principles, and attitudes, as well as change in ourselves, it will make us take another look at the one who never changes. Jesus Christ is the same, eternally the same. Blessed be his name. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The work of Jesus never stops. There are approximately 2.2 billion Christians in the world today. And when you begin to think about the number of Christians throughout the ages, it's staggering. But how many of their stories do you remember? Martin Luther, William Carey, Hudson Taylor, or maybe my personal favorite, Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, today's heroes will also eventually pass on into memory. And many of us remember them and often imitate their faith. Leaders like Billy Graham and Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King Jr., C.S. Lewis, and countless others. All of them are on the steady progression from memory to history, from cherished to forgotten. But there is one who will never be forgotten, whose work has never ceased, and who we can both remember and still reach out to, Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. F.F. F. Bruce wrote, his help, his grace, his power, his guidance are permanently at his people's disposal. He never needs to be replaced and nothing can be added to his perfect work. Situations and circumstances will change. Society will shift. People around you will change. They will disappoint you, hurt you, they'll let you down. Not all change is bad. Some change is necessary and good, but even good change can make you feel unsettled and unsure of the future. And we will face an increasing amount of change. But remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus was working in your past, and he is working right now. And Jesus will be working for you in the future. You could always trust him, and you can always trust him. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to pray for you this morning. Jesus, we thank you that you are constant. We thank you that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. God, that you were working for us in the past. God, that you are working for us in the present. And that, God, you will continue to work for us 
in the future. God, we thank you that you are a faithful God who we can place our trust in. God, we can trust the promises that you have made in your word. And and Father, we can know that you will bring those promises through to fulfillment. God, I pray that you would be with each and every one listening online this morning. God, that you would bring a calm, a peace, a stillness to their heart. And God, that you would breathe a fresh breath, a new hope into their lives. Because God, they can look to you knowing that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, you are working on their behalf. And God, you will continue to work. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us online here at Station Church this morning. And if nobody's told you that you are loved, know that I, Pastor Brittany, love you. And you are loved here at Station Church. We will see you next Sunday. Have a great week, everyone. Come on and sing it.